So we're going to start out by looking at the results of the teen morality survey you guys took yesterday. All right, so obviously no notes on that. Uh, I'm not trying to make some great, grand, overarching conclusions from them. It's just a snapshot, you know, but I do appreciate your honesty. So we'll look at each of the questions that you answered, and we'll see what the percentages were, and then I'll tell you how it stacks up to last year, right? And then I'll do the same next year. They'll compare themselves to you. You're right away. We'll take a few notes after this slide. Okay, so the first question I asked you was what your faith expression was. Um, just to get a snapshot of where we're at. So obviously around 70% are Catholic or Orthodox. Uh, looks like under 10% Protestant. A little over non-Christians and then a little under agnostic or atheist. And that's about what it was last year. Last year was like 70% Catholic or Orthodox. And then agnostic or atheist were like 11 and a half. Uh, the other two were lower. So that's not, not a big difference, but uh, it's probably what's expected. I think it's been pretty standard in this school for a while here, right? So it shows some diversity for a Catholic school. Now, if you have an expressed faith, do you attend services when required? For a Catholic, that would be, do you go every Sunday and every Holy Day? Um, so it looks like just a little over 50% of you say that you do. That's pretty good. And, you know, it's higher than a national average. It's a little higher than last year. They were like a 44%, okay? Now, no and rarely never, you know, are kind of the same. I'm going to have to differentiate those better next year when I ask that question. Um, but some say a few times per year, okay? So most hold their faith well. Now, for a certain percentage here, a little over, like almost 25%, there's a disconnect, okay? But nonetheless... What statement most represents your view of Catholic morality? Now, I'll have to read, you know, what the categories were, all the text isn't up there. The first one was, I understand some Catholic moral teaching, but I need to understand it better. Uh, so that was the highest group, a little over 30%. Uh, that, quite honestly, was one of the lower groups last year. Uh, I understand some Catholic uh, morality, though I'm open to understanding it better. That was the longest one last year. That was over 30%. Um, you guys are just under 20. That's, that, that's a good category to be in. It's honest, right? Even this group here, they understand some. Here, I want to know more. That's terrific. The third one is I'm Catholic and I disagree on some major Catholic moral teachings. You know, at this age, you'd expect some of that. But by the time you're 30, 35, you need to reconcile that, right? Uh, in other words, understand it better, or you know how do you, how do you get your faith in line with what you profess? That's really um, what it comes down to. There are some things, quite frankly, that on morality, the Catholic Church it, it will never ever change. I know some people think that you know well it might in the future. It, it, it hasn't in the past. It's been two thousand years. Right? Uh, number four, I'm Catholic, and there's very little I will agree with. Okay, well it could be maybe you're raised in your faith, and there's really nothing there that's been expressing it. You know, so as much as I hope it's a renaissance for you, it could be that, you know, you'll wind up being in the agnostic or atheist group if you don't reconcile that type of stuff, okay? This one, I'm not Catholic, uh, but I hope to learn what the Catholic Church teaches. You know, that's inspiring. That would be me if I were in China taking a class on Buddhism. I don't understand it, but I'm really am interested in what they believe. And me being interested in what they believe wouldn't make me a Buddhist. It just make me, you know, uh, informed. So I'm glad for that. This one, I'm not Catholic, and I think I'll disagree with major issues. That's to be expected, right? And the bottom one, I'm not Catholic, and there's very little I will agree with. Well, if, you know, you're an atheist or agnostic, that might be the group. It's, it's hard to say. So you can't make too much out of this, though. I'm not trying to do that. What are your views on the sources of morality? In other words, where does um, someone be, um, get their ideas of what is or is not moral? It has its origin in God. It has been revealed. That's all inspiring. 55%. That was like 20% last year. Uh, the, by the way, that's the Catholic Church's belief. All right? The second one, it has its origins in man. Uh, man has determined it. Uh, last year's like 7%, now it's like 10 uh, That's a really a hard one to hold on to. I've mentioned Pythagoras before. You guys know the Pythagorean theorem. 
his famous quote was, man is the measure of all things. Okay, well, Aristotle beat that apart. And Aristotle's a pagan, you know. Uh, Aristotle pointed out, and I'll use today's you know, terminology, if somebody came to you and said, how long is a yardstick? It's as long as a yardstick. That's what that phrase means, that man is the standard of all things. How can a person be their own standard? No more so than a yardstick can be the standard of yardsticks. Yes, Renee? Uh, yes. Number three, it has its origins in culture. It depends on your culture. Well, a lot of people believe that. You guys are right around 13%. Last year was like 20-some percent. Um, that's actually called cultural relativism. Um, and if you held to that, you'd have a hard time calling Germany bad, right? Because what if their culture was okay with what they did? Um, it's been learned over time. Um, as time progresses, man learns. Again, last year, that was the largest group. Here, you have uh, 20, 22%. In the video that I'm going to show you, and you'll take notes from in the next slide, you'll see why that's impossible. And we'll talk about that then. Okay. What are your general views on marriage? So you have roughly 30, what, 7% say it's only between one man and one woman for life. That was the largest, uh, I'm sorry, that was about the same size as last year's. As a matter of fact, these look almost identical. Number two, it's, it's between any two people who love each other. You guys are near 60%, they're at 55%. This is the law of the United States, okay? Number three, it can be any arrangement that's consensual. Last year was like 3.5%, looks about the same. Number four, I don't believe marriage should exist at all. 2.6% um, last year, probably the same. So I'll give you a heads up. When we start studying marriage, I don't care if you're atheist or Catholic. <coughs> These are your only two choices. <coughs> You can't, you can't even rationally hold these choices. And I'll show you why. And I'll even show you, you know, atheists and lesbians who say you, just, you can't hold these positions. All right? So we'll look at that, though. But anyway, nice snapshot. By the way, if this would have been taken... Um, no, I want to hold off the next one. Before. I don't want to comment too much. What are your views on the beginning of life issues? Okay, so the majority of you... 50-some um, percent say that uh, human life and personhood uh, begins at conception and continues until natural death. That's wonderful. You are the pro-life generation. Uh, when I went to high school, it would probably be down closer to like 15 to 18 um, percent. Why exactly is it so high with your generation? We can argue about that all day. My opinion, science. Science has showed us so much about, you know, human conception that it's getting hard to really make an argument otherwise, right? Okay, the next one is abortion should be illegal, except for rape, okay? So you had some people in that group. The third, uh, a human doesn't become a person until they're born. Well, that's the law of the United States. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, so in, not a person, out person. I mean, even atheist philosophers are like, how do you, how do, you do that, right? So if we did a C-section and pulled the baby out, now it's a person, we put it back, I mean, it's a little odd, right? This one, a human person, uh, a human becomes a person um, when they're self-aware, which is probably like four to five months, okay? And this one, it's impossible to know um, when, a, when a human becomes a person. You know, that would be difficult. And this is what slavery was confused about, right? I mean, if we don't know what a human person is, why are we moving on? So when we talk about this, and we will do it in class, I'll tell you these are the only two positions you can rationally hold. And I'll show you that. Uh, Peter Sanger, the atheist uh, professor of philosophy from Princeton University, says that you are not a human person until you are self-aware. Four to five months. So what? So you can kill a two-month-old? Yes, because they're not a person. And if you told him, well, I think they should be a person because they're outside of the womb, he'd say, that's a ridiculous argument. And he would, so, in other words, He's good all the way up to five or six months. It should be the parent's choice. That would be his. Now, that sounds like, you know, disgusting to us, but it's rational, okay? I mean, it's, it's consistent. It may, it may go against good reason, but he, he comes by it. He's consistent. I should have said that better than calling it rational. All right. What is your strongest view on poverty? You know, depending on how you understood this, you can't make too much of it. Uh, one is they would rise it themselves with opportunity and education. It, it's probably true for, for some, 
But you know, the single greatest indicator of your future financial status is your parents' present financial status. So you can take somebody's financial status today, lay it on a grid, and predict yours for the future, and that'll be the single greatest indicator. So it isn't all about education and um, opportunity. Um, two, they become dependent on government too easy. That, there's something to that, right? The Catholic Church talks very much um, to the point where we have to watch creating a welfare state. In other words, we need welfare. We need unemployment insurance. People hit hard times. But when you have three generations on welfare, there's something systemic going wrong, all right? Um, or, you know, like I was an employer for many years, and I'd have people that would come in to get an application for employment. I would not give them an application for employment. They came in. I had people coming in dressed like you can imagine, smoking a cigarette, can I get an application like the worker? I had one guy show up with no shirt on, tattoos all over. That's how he came to get an application. Now, why would I give it to them? Am I making fun of people like that? No, because I know how unemployment works. If you want to receive unemployment, you have to be actively looking for a job. How do they know if you're actively looking for a job? You show them with your submitted applications. So what is it that you can do to keep not getting a job and staying on unemployment? Don't apply to some place that's never going to hire you, and you're good. Okay? So we have to watch that. That's that's an issue, right? Um, they share some of the fault. Well, that would fall underneath that, so that's true too. The system is stacked. It works against the poor. It often does. It often does. It's often hard to get out of the basement, right? So there's something to all of these, okay? So we don't, again, let's not make any overarching <coughs> conclusions. Do you consider yourself a good person? You are nice people, 85%. I'm glad. I'm glad you think that of yourself. Um, you're a little higher than last year. There were 80% of them thought they were good. Do you think you lie fairly often? Well, 33% said yes. Last year, 66% said they lied very often. That's not great. That's probably not great either, but I ask you to be honest. Of course, if you're lying, we all know if you're lying on this, right? That's the problem with this, right? Did you pick up on that? Have you cheated on a major assessment at BC this year? Well, I'd say roughly 15%. Does anybody want to guess what the percentage was last year? No. 80. 80% 80 said they cheated on a major assessment. Unless they were lying... And since 80% called themselves a good person, something's askew there, right? They're a bunch of lying cheats. Those seniors, trust me, they got a kick out of that when they saw it on the screen. You guys are much more consistent. <coughs> Would your parents say you regularly are respectful to them? Oh, you guys have lucky parents. 90%, right? Well... Last year, they only thought like 60%. I guess they were just saying, you know, uh, why should we even lie about it? You know, if you ask them, they're going to say no. It's fun to watch these. Right? Do you think you're respectful of your teachers? Oh, we're lucky. I know, I know. We're lucky. We're lucky. That's almost the same thing as last year, 96%. Now, what was odd last year was 80% cheated. But 96% said they respected us, so I'm not quite sure what that meant. Um, they are a bunch of lying cheaters. <laughs> oh, not you two. Yeah, you two. I know you're good. Okay. Have now this. I'm sorry. This should have said immorality. We all should be involved in sexual morality. <laughs> I don't know why it was worth it. Well, so I really don't know how people interpret this, okay? That was my fault. So let's, let's just pretend that they got what I was saying. Um, have you been involved in sexual immorality? 30% um, said uh, yes. Last year, around 42% said yes. And we did this last year not through SurveyMonkey, but a text to poll. So it was anonymous, but they were sitting there with their cell phones texting. And we saw like the screen go live. We've done that here before. And as they saw, you know, the, the people who are admitting to sexual morality, the, the, the people that, I, you know, they were calling other ones liars in class. You guys are lying, that type of thing. So, well, let's just assume everybody's honest, okay? 
Do you think of others before yourself? Well, the majority of you do, do and I'm glad to hear that. That's uh, just around 80%. That's what last year. Now, this has to line up. Now, see how many people think well of others? You know, well, something's, I mean, you guys are doing pretty good here. For only like 15% of you to say you bully other people, you know, in one way or another, however you interpret bullying, I didn't give you that. That's pretty good. But, but last year, 60% admitted to bullying other people. I mean, I thought we had a cage match going on in the junior class, all right? So anyway, anyway, so I appreciate it. Um, again, I just do it for all of us to get a snapshot of what's going on. We can't make any big conclusions on it. We see a little bit of disconnect sometimes, right? Um, but we don't know who did what. I didn't keep track of it like that. Uh, but the reality is, it's not so perfect, all right? So let's start with a little bit of notes. Well, I'm making a transition, so. He's like, I have a headache. Don't do that. Okay. Let's start out with a definition. Let's start out with a definition. What is it that we are studying? What does it mean to say that I'm studying morality? <coughs> rational is with your mind, your intellect. This is the rational ordering of the human act. So we are going to look at human actions. If you are the type of person that says, well, I don't like judging other people, well, then how do you call anything good or bad? I mean, this is where you do judge. You judge the actions, okay? The rational ordering of the human act to the good in truth, it has to be connected to truth. And the voluntary pursuit in the voluntary pursuit of that truth known by reason. I know that's a big definition, but they're all the words are important. And the voluntary pursuit of that truth known by reason. The voluntary pursuit of that truth known by reason. So that's what we're going to do in this class. We're going to look at human actions. We're going to compare them in goodness and truth. And we're going to say the person is moral when they voluntarily pursue those. Okay? And it has to be done through reason. In other words, we often think that if a, people, if a person has uh, um, some <coughs> mitigated circumstances where they have their capacity for the intellect is diminished, <coughs> that makes them less culpable, right? Okay, so what I have next is a six-minute video by uh, Dr. Peter Craig of Boston College. And he's going to talk about um, morality and the, the existence of God. I am not concerned in this course using this argument for the existence of God. It's just a nice introduction. He will talk about five different things, and he'll give you plenty of time to read to write them down. He'll talk about evolution, reason, conscience, human nature, and utilitarianism. And he'll explain why none of those can be a standard. So do your best to take notes. This is good practice. It's he's slow. It's real time. You can't ask him to repeat it. Okay. I'm going to argue for the existence of God from the premise that more we'll good and then. evil really exist. They are not simply a matter of personal taste, not merely substitutes for I like and I don't like. Before I begin, let's get one misunderstanding out of the way. My argument does not mean that atheists can't be moral. Of course, atheists can behave morally, just as theists can behave immorally. Let's start then with a question about good and evil. Where do good and evil come from? Atheists typically propose a few possibilities. Among these are evolution, reason, conscience, human nature, and utilitarianism. I will show you that none of these can be the ultimate source of morality. Why not from evolution? Because any supposed morality that is evolving can change. If it can change for the good or the bad, there must be a standard above these changes to judge them as good or bad. For most of human history, more powerful societies enslaved weaker societies and prospered. That's just the way it was, and no one questioned it. Now we condemn slavery. But based on a merely evolutionary model, that is an ever-changing view of morality, 
Who is to say that it won't be acceptable again one day? Slavery was once accepted, but it was not therefore acceptable. And if you can't make that distinction between accepted and acceptable, you can't criticize slavery. And if you can make that distinction, you are admitting to objective morality. But what about reasoning? While reasoning is a powerful tool to help us discover and understand morality, it cannot be the source of morality. For example, criminals use reasoning to plan a murder without their reason telling them that murder is wrong. And was it reasoning or something higher than reasoning that led those Gentiles who risked their life to save Jews during the Holocaust? The answer is obvious. It was something higher than reasoning. Because risking one's life to save a stranger was a very unreasonable thing to do. Nor can conscience alone be the source of morality. Every person has his own conscience, and some people apparently have none. Heinrich Himmler, chief of the brutal Nazi SS, successfully appealed to his henchmen's consciences to help them do the right thing in murdering and torturing millions of Jews and others. How can you say your conscience is right and Himmler's is wrong if conscience alone is the source of morality? The answer is, you can't. Some people say human nature is the ultimate source of morality. But human nature can lead us to do all sorts of reprehensible things. In fact, human nature is the reason we need morality. Our human nature leads some of us to do real evil and leads all of us to be selfish, unkind, petty, and egocentric. I doubt you would want to live in a world where human nature was given free reign. Utilitarianism is the claim that what is morally right is determined by whatever creates the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But to return to our slavery example, if 90% of the people would get great benefit from enslaving the other 10%, would that make slavery right? According to utilitarianism, it would. We've seen where morality can't come from. Now let's see where it does come from. What are moral laws? Unlike the laws of physics or the laws of mathematics, which tell us what is, the laws of morality tell us what ought to be. But like physical laws, they direct and order something. And that something is right human behavior. But since morality doesn't exist physically, there are no moral or immoral atoms or cells or genes, its cause has to be something that exists apart from the physical world. That thing must therefore be above nature or supernatural. The very existence of morality proves the existence of something beyond nature and beyond man. Just as a design suggests a designer, moral commands suggest a moral commander. Moral laws must come from a moral lawgiver. Well, that sounds pretty much like what we know as God. So the consequence of this argument is that whenever you appeal to morality, you are appealing to God, whether you know it or not. You're talking about something religious, even if you think you're an atheist. I'm Peter Kreeft, professor of philosophy at Boston College for Prager University. All right, so why did he say evolution is not an acceptable way to determine morality? What did he say? Yes? Because it would be an ever-changing uh, like way of morality? Yeah. I mean, evolution, by its very name, is about change and adaptation, right? So. How then, see here's, here's the difficulty, right? If we thought evolution, and nobody talks like that by the way, nobody says, well I think evolution is what determines morality. You hear people use other terms or phrases. You'll hear them say something as, come on, this isn't the middle legal times. Come on, this is 2017, get with it, right? They talk in terms like that. They're arguing that we've you know, evolved this over time. Here's the difficulty. We're arrogant if we think that. And what I mean by that, not that the person themselves is being arrogant, but it's an arrogant thought to think we're the pinnacle of morality. So we have figured out what those poor goofs in the 1600s couldn't figure out. My God, they were hanging people in the public squares. You know, kings would live like kings and the peasants would eat nothing. 
but we now know that's wrong. How do we know in five or six hundred years from now they're not look, they're not going to look back on us like we're a bunch of you know bumpkins, you know, living in, you know in the dark ages? How do we know they're not going to consider what we did an evil time, right? So it's hard to say. So that's why evolution you know evolution is about change and adaptation. There's no reason to believe that we figured it out. They might find that we're as odd or backward as we think the medieval period is. Reason. Why do they say reason is not a way to determine? Why do they say reason is not a way to determine what is or is not moral? Using it a tool, not a uh, source. It's a tool, not a source. If we use it as a source, what was he gave a couple examples. Well, he gave an example that shows why it's bad, and another example I think he gave to show... Um, well, why morality exists. Does anybody remember? What do you have? It was the uh, murder, like using reason to commit the crime. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, murders reason through, um, you know, criminals reason through what they're doing. But the other thing he said is that oftentimes what we do that is moral is not reasonable, right? So if you, I mean, let's even think, like I saw something on Facebook. It was one of those videos that went around. And obviously this dog fell into the frozen pond. And it showed a guy, I guess the pond, he must have known the pond wasn't deep enough. He was literally walking through the water, crushing the ice with his hands to get to the dog. And you look at that and you think, what a generous thing to do for an animal. But what's reasonable about that? We don't, who thinks that an animal's life is equal to a human's life and he might have died doing that, you know? So, we could give other examples. He used the example of people saving the Jews during the, um, you know, World War II. Is that reasonable for you to bring somebody into your house where if they were found, your entire family would be killed? So reason is a tool, but it's not something that helps determine it. How about conscience? What did he say about conscience? Come on, somebody else. Come on. Hey, you go. You got the floor, sir. People have uh, the varying consciences, and who's to say which conscience is right? Absolutely. I mean, conscience is varied. You know, and there you're almost talking about us being the standard of ourselves, right? How do we do that? You know, my wife, Mrs. Boyle, some of you will meet her on Friday when we go to March for Life. She's a very generous person. So oftentimes, if somebody does something they shouldn't do, well, you know what? They're going to have to live with themselves. Let's see how they sleep at night. Well, maybe that's true for somebody, but that's only a problem if you have a good conscience. If you don't have a good conscience, like, do you guys know who Ted Bundy is? He was a serial killer. He was a charming guy. He would find women, and they would gladly go with him, and he'd kill them. When they finally caught him, and he's in prison, the guard said, this guy's absolutely friendly and charming. He slept like a baby every night. His conscience was not bothering him. According to what he did, really, what was the big deal? You know? So our conscious if we're going to say our conscious is the standard, then there's no standard. You can only say my conscience works for me, but if you do something wrong, I can't even say it's wrong because it might not go against your conscience. So there's a lack of a standard there. How about human nature? What did they say about human nature? Uh, like to use an example of like how like a world being led completely by human nature could go so wrong. Absolutely. Now, we will talk in the future how we're made in God's image, okay? But we're talking here about our natural instincts that have gone awry, okay? So when a person steals, for no other reason than I really like to have that iPhone, all right? Human nature wants to cut out the middleman. They don't want to work for it. They don't want to get the right way. So morality, he said, absolutely has to regulate human nature. Human nature itself, we're going to wind up being egocentric. We're going to wind up at the lowest base. This is, you know, what problems we have, right? Anything else on that? Okay, last, utilitarianism. What did he say is wrong with utilitarianism? Well, I was hoping you guys would get better notes than this. I will make the most good for uh, the most people, but that means that some people might not be happy because they might be like slaves or something. Absolutely. Utilitarianism is the most happiness for the most people. What does that mean? That if you're a minority, no one cares about your happiness in that particular country. So in other words, if, why would slavery, slavery be abolished if it didn't affect the majority? 
the utilitarian says, hey, look, you know, we, we can get a lot more stuff done if we enslave these people and they can do it for free. Okay, now before I get off that, let me bop back to um, evolution. How do we know, and I think he even mentioned it, how do we know that, let's say, okay, this is 2017, let's say in the year 2350 that we go back to slavery, but it's not based on your creed or your color, it's based on your genetics. What if they determine that that really is a good thing? For instance, did anybody here read Brave New World? Okay, you, really, you need to read that if you haven't. There are alphas, there are betas, there are deltas, there are epsilons. People who were basically produced to only exist at that certain level of intellect. So the alphas, who are on top, obviously, they don't have to do any of the physical work the epsilons will do that. And the epsilons and the deltas are glad that they're not the alphas because that's too much thinking. I'd rather just work in a factory. So entire people have been, in a sense, quote unquote, enslaved based on their intellect and their predispositions for activity. And that society, even though it's a fictional dystopian society, finds it perfectly good. They would look back on us and say, these barbarians, you know, what did they do? They had to go to school and they had to get degrees after their names. And who had the, this, the best degree? They could get the better jobs. And that was, who knows? It could be that very not people weren't too smart, got good degrees. People that were smart didn't get degrees. We are more scientific. We have determined genetically who is superior, and we allow that genetics then to govern who has what. That's the problem with these types of morality. So we'll look at all this. And I'm not worried about the argument for God. That was in the end where he said, if, and it's not by a Christian God, it just means supernatural power, right? If these powers are outside of the human person, then it must be not natural, but supernatural.